In this video, we're going to take a look at all the oddest hockey equipment that hockey skaters have ever used to play the game. We're going to skip over goalie gear, since we already did a video on that. Check the description to check out the oddest goalie equipment of all time. And before we get started, I wanted to announce the launch of the Sport Antic t-shirt shop for apparel that is authentically designed for sports fanatics. Check it out in the description below. And now for the countdown of the most unique hockey equipment. For first on our list, we have slotted sticks. Traditionally, hockey sticks have been made from solid pieces of wood, but in recent years, sticks have transitioned and are now made out of synthetic composites that allow the puck to shoot off faster from the increase in flex that the composite material provides. In the early 2000s, when these sticks became mainstays, manufacturers started to experiment to see if they could try different techniques that may make a better hockey stick. One of the odd experiments was the Reebok O stick. The idea was, with holes in the shaft, there was less air resistance on the stick, and you would be able to move your stick faster. Reebok didn't like to refer to them as holes, though. They called them power ports, and Reebok claimed that they could lower the stick's kick point and help the stability. Whether that's actually what they do is up for debate. The best thing that Reebok did with the O stick was getting star forward Pavel Datsuk to play the 07-08 season with the stick. That year, Datsuk scored 97 points, won the Selkie Trophy for best defensive forward, and helped the Red Wings win a Stanley Cup. The following year, Datsuk no longer used the O stick, but did use a different Reebok stick. In 09, Datsuk repeated as Selkie winner, got 97 points again, and was third in MVP voting behind only Evgeny Malkin and winner Alex Ovechkin. So it was hard to attribute 08 success to the gimmicky stick. But the O stick was not just used by Datsuk. Several other NHL players also used the newest model of the O stick. By 2010, Reebok appeared to have moved on from the O stick and concentrated on their new stick technology, the Sick Kick stick. And a few years later after that, Reebok was phased out as a hockey gear brand altogether in favor of using the CCM brand, and the O stick was never heard from again. But the concept of holes and sticks was not gone for good. But now, the slots are in the blade of the stick. The Tovey Diamond Air blade stick has diamond holes throughout the blade of the stick that almost mimics the design of a floorball hockey stick. This stick, first seen in 2019, has its own tacky coating that's used on the stick so that you don't need to use tape, since tape would defeat the purpose of the holes in the stick. To me, it almost looks like a cheese grater that's been placed at the end of a hockey stick. I've seen this stick get some action in NCAA hockey, but I've not seen it in the NHL. Yet. But be on the lookout, because NHL players have been seen practicing and experimenting with the stick. The Bauer Nexus ADV is designed to be as light as possible, and Bauer released this version of the stick in January of 2020. It was only released to several NHL players. Bauer explains that it decided to put a hole in the blade not only for aerodynamics, but because the hole creates two separate sections that work together while loading and releasing a shot, kind of like a slingshot. Bauer says that it reinforces the edges of the hole of the blade to ensure that the durability is on par with their elite level sticks, which would have been my biggest concern with the stick. What I find interesting is how many of the players are just taping over the hole, which leads me to believe that the aerodynamics aspect of the hole is negligible. The stick can now be bought by anyone on the open market as the Bauer Sling, and it still has yet to be seen if it will really take grip in the market. Both of these sticks kind of remind me of the old plastic street hockey stick blades that you could get for a few bucks to screw into an old broken wooden stick. Though I don't remember anyone claiming that these holes gave anyone a special advantage. It's just interesting to see that a concept that's actually been around for a while can get cleaned up and come back later as a new product. Next up, we have spring-loaded skates. Skaters will try anything to get an extra speed boost for an edge. In 2013, an engineering student named Jeff Aslan took a look at hockey skates and tried to think of a way to improve them. What he came up with was adding a spring underneath the skate blade to allow you to push off and get an extra boost with each stride. If this sounds a little out there to you, it might be worth taking a closer look. In speed skating, spring-loaded and hinged skates known as clap skates have dominated long track speed skating since they were allowed, starting in 1998. Clap skates are hinged spring-loaded skates that pivot when a skater pushes off. In speed skating, a study done by Van Ingren Skinal in 1995, who was working on the development of the clap skate for speed skating, determined that those that wore the spring-loaded hinged skates gained a 6.2% speed increase. 
So when we look at the idea for spring-loaded skates for hockey, we can see that this idea has some merit. After some refinements to reduce complexity and decrease weight, Jeff's spring-loaded hockey skate company called Blade Tech developed the Flex Force Advantage Blade. These blades achieve the spring pivoting action by using flexible steel runners that can flex without the need of a separate spring. These Blade Tech runners only need to flex a fraction of an inch to provide an increased cushion stride with an expected 5.5% speed increase. And if you're wondering why these types of skates aren't being used in the NHL, the answer is, they are. Players are learning about this new technology, and more and more players in pro leagues are already switching over to Blade Tech's flexing skate blades. Next up, we have jaw protection helmet add-ons. We all know hockey can be a tough sport and injuries can happen. And when a player gets a jaw injury but needs to keep playing, some special equipment may be needed to let you keep playing. Nowadays, when players get their jaw hurt, they have the option to wear a full shield or a special jaw protector for their injury. And as most players are used to wearing half shield visors, this is not too big of an adjustment depending on who you ask. And since many of the players today grew up playing with a full face cage, some players nowadays will opt to go back to a face cage if they're used to the visual obstructions. But if you look back three or more decades, the landscape of equipment for jaw protection was quite different. Players in the junior leagues don't even have to wear cages, so the visual obstruction that a cage would provide is something that would not be accepted by top players. Even in youth hockey, players in this era did not wear full cages. The full bubble style face shields that some players wear today when hurt were not yet around. So if a player wanted to play with a jaw injury, some special equipment would be needed. Pat LaFontaine was a player who throughout his career was known for taking multiple blows to the head, but also for getting back into the game with minimal recovery time and in November of 1991, he was delivered a blow that broke his jaw. In order to continue playing, he had a special jaw protector designed by Dr. John Butch, made from aluminum by Buffalo Forge, added to his helmet so he could continue to play. This special protector was attached to his helmet and allowed him to have the same visor that he was used to and provided protection to his jaw. Later that same season, Rick Tockett had his jaw broken and wore a similar type jaw protector in the playoffs but Tockett didn't do as good of a job of letting the injury heal. Prior to this custom design jaw protector, if a player wanted to play with a facial injury, they had to get creative if they wanted to keep their faces protected without blocking their vision. In December of 1985, Gerard Gallant broke his jaw in a fight with North Stars forward Dirk Graham. After a six week absence, Gallant returned with a football mask installed on his hockey helmet to protect his jaw while allowing him to see better than if he had a full cage. But after only six and a half games, Gallant removed the football cage because he felt it was obstructing his view too much. In 1975, Capitals forward Jack Lynch donned a lacrosse helmet to protect his broken cheekbone for a game against the Blackhawks. And in 1968, when Bobby Hall was hit in the face with an elbow from the Toronto Maple Leafs' Mike Pellick, he came back six weeks later donning a football helmet with a Dunguard face mask, similar to the one worn by Larry Zonka. Though Bobby had some crudely added modifications done to his helmet by cutting out ear holes and air holes near the top. After his jaw healed up enough, Bobby went back to not wearing a helmet at all. Next up, we have Cooperalls. Traditionally, when a player skates out, he's wearing short hockey pants around the waist and hockey socks around the shins. But for a cold weather sport, wouldn't it make more sense if the pants were long? This is the question that Cooper answered in the late 70s with the introduction of the Cooperall. Cooperalls were long pants made out of a nylon material that combined the traditional hockey pants and hockey socks into a single overalls-like piece of hockey equipment. Cooperalls featured an elastic girdle that went from the rib cage down to the top of the knees and had foam pads sewn into them. Cooperalls were also available in short style breezers that you'd wear traditional hockey socks with, just like a regular hockey setup. Most people remember Cooperalls from the 1981-82 season, when they were worn by the Flyers. And in the 1982-83 season, they were joined by the Whalers, as both teams wore the long pants. But in actuality, neither of these teams actually wore Cooperalls. If you look closely, you'll see that these pants are manufactured by CCM, and are actually the CCM knockoff versions of Cooperalls called the CCM Pro Pack. But Cooperalls was the true name brand, and everyone called any long pants in hockey Cooperalls. Cooperalls' most noteworthy moment seems to be the fact that they were the pants being worn by the Flyers when they gave up Wayne Gretzky's 50th goal in only 39 games. 
However, they never really caught on in hockey. Many players complained that they were too hot. Some players complained that when they fell, they would keep on sliding. And goalies would complain that the all-black Cooperalls made the puck too hard to see. So by the time the 1983-84 season was getting started, the NHL banned the use of Cooperalls. Cooperalls gained somewhat of a legendary status after that. Canadian singer Jolie Blue even wrote a whole song dedicated to the experimental short-lived piece of hockey fashion. Well, my socks are my pants and my pants are my socks. I'm scoring Geno, scoring apples in the pylons. Gawk. They seem to produce a love it or hate it type reaction from both players and fans. They seem to appear in every worst looking equipment list that ever gets made, but have articles and songs dedicated to how great they are. In a response to the cult favorite piece of apparel, the Flyers brought back the Cooperalls in the 2022 season as part of their reverse retro jersey. But since the NHL never officially lifted the ban on these pants, they were only ever used in pregame warmups. Next up, we have geometric shaped stick shafts. For over a hundred years, the general rectangular shape of the hockey stick shaft remained unchanged. But around the turn of the millennium, as composite materials began to be used for sticks, companies started to experiment. It was around this time that a new stick company called Trilage launched. The design that they first came up with was definitely a head turner. Here's YouTuber Hockey Alley showing off an original Trilage velocity shaft. Trilage is a triangular shaft. This came out around 2001. Very uncomfortable, to be honest. It gave me a little bit of pressure on the wrist, so when I was holding, the grip was comfortable, but then the just gave you like a tension on the top of the wrist. Didn't feel right. Trilage believed in the power of triangles and developed the original hockey stick with a triangular shaft. The bottom of the stick tapered into a traditional rectangle so that it could accept standard stick blade replacements. This stick did not get positive feedback. It was awkward to hold in the hand and was difficult to flex. But Trilage considered this stick to be a research and development design, meant to be a proof of concept. Their next stick looked a bit more like a traditional design, but still incorporated triangular design features into the stick. The result was a design that had a convex concave look to it. The new stick was used in the NHL by a few players, like Darcy Tucker, Brad May, and Trevor Daly to name a few. The stick never caught on as broadly as originally hoped, and players began to switch to other sticks. But the refined design seemed to have influenced the design of the Reebok Ribcor stick. The Reebok Ribcor stick had a rib design feature that extended halfway up the shaft of the stick. The effect was a stick that looked a bit like the concave side of the improved Trillage. The idea behind the ribs is so that the stick would spring back to its original state faster in a shot for increased shot velocity. The Ribcor was then rebranded under CCM and was used in the NHL by players like Pavel Datsuk, among others. As of 2023, the CCM Ribcor is still available and for sale. Another one of CCM's unique sticks was an eight-sided stick called the Octagon. The Octagon was technically an eight-sided stick, but wasn't as extreme as it sounded. The Octagon looked like a standard stick, just with the corners lopped off for an eight-sided design at the bottom of the stick. The Bauer Nexus Geo Stick is a five-sided stick that looks to me to share a bit of the principles from the original triangular trillage stick. The Nexus is square at the top, but immediately tapers into its five-sided shape so that your bottom hand is gripping the five-sided shaft. The STX Surgeon Pure Grip is a stick with six sides, and it's designed primarily that way to fit more comfortably in your hands. This stick places three of the sides down where your fingers wrap around the stick for a supposed better grip. And the Bauer Sonic Taper is a stick that tapers down to seven sides near the blade of the stick. The idea behind this design is about adjusting the kick point where the stick flexes. Jack Eichel used this stick for a time when he was with the Buffalo Sabres. Next up, we have... Thermal Skates. The science of ice skating may not be as straightforward as it may first seem. When the blade of an ice skate meets contact with the ice, the friction of the metal blade contacting the ice heats up the ice, turning a micro amount of ice into water. This water then gets stuck underneath the skate, allowing the skate to glide across the ice while riding on this thin layer of water. This inspired Alberta resident Tony Weber to investigate a way to make a pair of skates that would complete this process even better than a traditional pair of skates. And what he came up with was thermoblades. These special hockey skates included a battery that used electric energy to heat up the skate blade, theoretically increasing the layer of water between the blade and the ice surface, reducing friction at the ice surface. 
The Thermoblade team showed off their skates to the Great One himself, Wayne Gretzky, who loved the idea, so much so that he became an investor. With Wayne Gretzky on board, they began to create production models of these skates. These skates included a port where you could recharge the built-in battery in between skate sessions. They began to appear in retail stores at a price of $400 for a pair of blade holders. Wayne Gretzky was able to get the skates to NHL players who tested them out in NHL games. The problem was, out of the five players that tried them, only one of them outside of Gretzky liked the way they felt. While the heating up of the blade should help, the added weight of the battery pack tucked inside the blade holder not only increased the weight of the skate in a market where skate manufacturers are making lighter and lighter skates, but they also changed the balance of the skate, which could take some getting used to. In the end, the added weight, additional maintenance, and the $400 price tag proved too much to overcome as a business venture, and the Thermoblade company filed for bankruptcy by 2010. But those that bought in still believe in the concept and technology behind the heated skate blade. Maybe in the future, we'll see a return of battery heated skates. But Thermoblades weren't the only skates that claim that heated blades can help with performance. T-Blades is a blade system unlike any other on the market. Instead of having a large hunk of metal for your skate blade like a traditional skate, T-Blades are mostly plastic, with a thin, small piece of metal at the bottom of their runners. The idea is for the runners to be as light as possible, and for the metal to be as durable as possible. The small amount of metal that is on the runner is hardened and polished at the factory. The good thing about that is that these runners last for up to four times longer before needing sharpened. The downside is, for the metal to be so thin, it means that they can't be sharpened. Once they're worn, the runners need to be replaced and thrown away, but that's by design. Ideally, a T-Blade owner would own multiple T-Blade runners, and then using the T-Blade system would be able to replace the runner on the spot at the rink with a simple tool. So a blown edge is a DIY swap job. The T in T-Blade stands for thermo, the idea being that since the metal on these skates is so thin, that it'll heat up fast from the natural friction of regular skating and will provide you with an easier glide. While these skates are not necessarily widespread, they do have plenty of hardcore fans, including players in the NHL, who appreciate the lighter weight in this skating system. While finding the replacement runners might not be something that you can always find at every hockey store, you can still get T-Blades and replacement runners today and in select retail locations. And before we get to our last item, I want to bring up some honorable mentions that don't need a deep dive but are too good to ignore. First, we have the Mission 3-Finger Glove, the idea being to combine your weakest two fingers into one glove slot to allow them to work together, but the result looks like something designed for another species. The Cooper XL7 helmet is a particularly odd-looking helmet that only existed for a split second, but was actually worn in some NHL games. The half cage, which combines the visibility of a cage and the protection of a half visor. Herb Raglan actually wore this in the NHL when recovering from an injury. Notice how he cut out the center bars for visibility. This referee combines the last two into a truly one-of-a-kind look. We have liquid tape, which was originally a 3M product you could place on your stick blade instead of using tape. This concept may actually make a comeback if the Tovey Diamond Air stick really catches on. We have the Lockjaw Blade, which is a replacement blade that instead of getting glued into the shaft of a two-piece stick, is screwed in using a special tool that allows you to screw the blade into a special lockjaw shaft. We have Mars Blades inline skates that have a pivoting action in the chassis above the wheels. Mars Blades also has an ice hockey pivoting system that requires special blade holders and special blades. I'm particularly fond of the large prototype Cascade helmet that eventually became the M11 helmet. Then there's Butch Goring's barely there Swedish Spaps helmet created by Sven Tumba in the 50s. We have Reebok pump ice skates that allow you to pump up your skates for a tighter fit, just like the basketball shoe of the time. We have these bent sticks that put the blade of the stick off center from your top hand. And last on our list of honorable mentions, we have the rolling chest and elbow pad combination that connects the elbow pads and the shoulder pads into one set of equipment. And for our final item on our regular list, we have the Gip Grip. In the early 80s, an amateur hockey player named Gerald Gibbons had the idea to improve the ergonomics of the hockey stick, particularly for players that used a short stick. He explains his invention and its beginnings here. Well, my idea is the angular hockey stick handle that's removably applicable. Well, sometimes when I would take the slap shot with a shorter stick, my left knee would get banged by, by the shaft. And I felt that if I could just offset it a little bit, and that's all I did was I just offset this, the stick by that much so that my hand was here 
instead of here, the shaft of the stick would be just a little bit higher, and that worked. But I found that in a course of a follow through, you now have a, a mechanical advantage lever up here by allowing yourself to twist the stick, then you can get the, the puck to spin off like a howitzer. With the help of some investors, Jerry had his idea designed and submitted for a US patent and a Canadian patent then had his idea sent to an injection molding factory for a mass production run on the product. But spreading the word and showcasing the benefits of the new device proved difficult in the hockey world. I talked to Bobby Clark. Uh, Bobby Clark was doubtful. Um, I talked to Gordy Howe. Gordy Howe uh, was dismissive. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that's just the way it was. The Gip Grip was sold mail order from ads in the Hockey News publication and at select Canadian tire retail locations, and despite some skepticism in the hockey world, was able to sell enough to recover most of the initial investment of the product. It was even spotted in professional games. I have heard through the grapevine that there are players who used it. Um, one, one of my uh, friends who's a referee who officiated in the National Hockey League uh, actually told me that he saw uh, uh, one player or two players uh, in a, in a, in a preseason game trying them out. The one player that he told me about actually used it in, in some NHL games, um, and that's the last I heard of it. By around 2006, the patent for the device had expired, and other companies began making their own angled hockey stick grips. Yeah, I've seen knockoffs from um, mostly companies that make street hockey equipment. I wouldn't uh, offend them by, by saying that what that they made were knockoffs. I, I don't think that they would have been able to survive a patent challenge back when my patent was still in, in force. Uh, but um, I'm gonna give them their, 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 their due credit. Um, they waited for the most part until the, my patent expired and now they made their own and it, I'm sure that it's not making them millions of dollars. Be sure to check out the full interview with Gip Grip inventor Gerald Gibbons, linked in the description below. And don't forget to check out the t-shirt shop for shirts like this one that pays homage to the original Gip Grip and other apparel sure to put a smile on any sports fanatic. What did you think of this list? Was there anything that was left out? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a thumbs up or subscribing to see more videos like this one in the future. A special thanks to all those that helped make this video possible, and to you the viewer. I hope you enjoyed.